<laughs> okay. Hey, girlfriend, let's have a logical, intelligent, objective discussion about full frame. Well, Fuji found that make full frame. That must be why you want... No, I'm not going to attack full frame. Let's be objective here. Logical, you know? I got lots of full frame sensor cameras. Uh, I got a lot of crop sensors. I got two uh, medium format cameras. Medium format blows the hell out of everything. No, that's not my definitive statement in this video. Um, specifically about full frame. Full frame advantages. Okay. Let's be logical here. And of course we have to look comparatively in the spectrum of things. Like where is it that full frame just that's it, right? Cheap. Let's let's be logical here and then let's make some intelligent because and by the way, and I always get these comments and people say, Well what's wrong with using a crop sensor for portraiture, landscape, or architecture? And the answer to that is absolutely nothing. But it's not ideal. You know, if I like wanted to go to Florida tomorrow, I could walk there. But it would be painful and slightly less than ideal. So all the people that always make these comments and there's always a bunch of like, what? What the hell is wrong with a crop sensor? Like I use my D500 for portraiture and and the landscape is like, you know, you're right. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it is slightly less than ideal. Yeah, it's kind of like clown cars. You know, you fit like 13 midgets into a clown car or something. It's like. Yeah, everybody's nose is planted in someone else's butt crack. You know, you could travel that way, but it's probably not ideal. <laughs> Did I make that abundantly clear before moving on in this little objective, hopefully intelligent discussion? Yes, full frame advantages. Tilt shift. Oh my God, yeah. By the way, Canon owns everybody's ass uh, with their 17 millimeter tilt shift. Nikon makes a really great one, especially the new 19 millimeter perspective control lens, yeah, which is a tilt shift lens. Pretty damn expensive. I've fully tested the lens, would love to have it. I own quite a few tilt shift lenses. My favorite one is the 24 millimeter. Now for product, people think those are just for architecture and landscape, which they're great for, but they're used a lot for product photography, like the 80 millimeter. 85 millimeter, excuse me, macro uh, Fuji film. Um, excuse me, Nikon. Hello, uh, wake up, McFly. The 85 millimeter uh, tilt shift uh, Nikkor for uh, food photography, product photography. Um, full frame owns everybody's butt on tilt shift, and tilt shift lenses are insanely useful for architecture. You know all those converging lines, like you see in trees and the buildings. I, Full frame owns everybody's ass. If you someone said we're going to go out and do, uh, we're going to go out and do architecture and then do uh, food photography, you wouldn't think of like doing professional architecture without a tilt shift. Now you can do some of that stuff in post. Actually, you do a lot of it in post, but you end up uh, having to crop out a bunch of the images to uh, recorrect uh, for converging parallels. There's a reason why perspective control lenses exist. So full frame owns everybody's ass meaning medium format. And of course, now, if you, now I know exactly what you're going to say. You could buy a Cambo Actus for a bazillion dollars. They're very expensive. And then you could stick a nice um, old school 4x5 uh, large format lens on there and stick your medium format on there. And you'll own all everybody's ass on that department. And you're right. But it requires a tripod. It's huge, expensive. The learning curve is astronomical. Well, it's actually not astronomical. It's a pain in the butt. <sighs> then you're going to have to buy yourself uh, several full frame, which are relatively cheap compared to what they used to be. Total pain in the ass. Unbelievable. Okay? So, yes, you can own... And, by the way, some of the best uh, landscape and architectural images are... With a medium format camera, whether that be Phase One or Fujifilm, a Cambo Actus or an equivalent, Cambo Actus owns everybody on that front, and uh, sticking a 4x5 uh, lens, literally, uh, or an 8x10 lens, excuse me, an 8x10 or even a 4x5 lens, which has a huge image circle. But you could do so much tilting, shifting, and swaying, you'd be moving your hips, moving the, the Cambo Actus like a Shakira's hips. So, yes, medium format. It's extremely impractical, and you have to be a masochist to really want to do that. If someone pays you a lot of money, then that's what you're going to do, but nobody else. You know, there's like two people on planet Earth, or maybe five, that are using a Cambo Actus. <laughs> and I bet, literally, it's about five people on planet Earth that actually use that thing. Um, 
uh, due to the glass ecosystem, a la Canon and Nikon. Even Fujifilm knows that uh, you know Nikon and Canon own it for this for hardcore sports, action, wildlife, and photojournalism. Now, let me make a remark about that too, because a lot of National Geographic photographers recently, people, they could rent the most expensive gear in the world, like fifteen thousand dollar eight hundred millimeter Nikkors and six hundred millimeter uh, Nikkors. They're using crop sensor cameras because there's more cropability on a crop sensor, but that's due to uh, information density on the sensor. Then, of course, you know, like a D7200 is ideal. You know, if you had uh, free range to use whatever you wanted, I'd take a, uh, a Nikon D7200, even a Nikon D500, but a D7200, a lot of National Geographic photographers, some of the most famous ones in the world with, you know, the most expensive glass in the world. Crop sensor does have an advantage there, but also, too, crop sensor has an advantage, and this is something people forget is that the autofocus module on the bottom of the light box on a full-frame sensor camera is no bigger than that on a crop sensor. So specifically, like if you've got like a 500 millimeter, just say a 200 to 500 millimeter Nikkor, you actually have a better hit rate of like sweeping uh, uh, action like cars or birds in flight because on the far periphery of, uh, of uh, your view, you actually have... Uh, uh, better coverage on a crop sensor camera than you do on a full frame sensor camera. And this is specifically only relational to DSLRs, not to mirrorless cameras, obviously. Point being that autofocus module is the same size in a crop sensor as it is in a full frame. It's not the sensor, it's the autofocus module. Wedding photography, right now we've, we've named one thing. Tilt shift, full frame owns everybody's ass. You know, unless you're a masochist and you want to buy a Cambo Actus, and you really have to be a, a masochist. Wedding photography, right? For the field of view, cheap, right? And you have to have a backup camera and backup lenses. 2470, 85 millimeter, 1.8G, 15 to 30, a macro lens for uh, capturing, uh, you know, the lace and the the cake detail icing and. Uh, 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 other macro shots like their wedding rings and whatnot. Uh, full frame does own wedding photography. It does. It just frigging does. However, now with the, we have a revolutionary camera in the case of the GFX. Well, that's a ten thousand dollar camera. That's really expensive. For medium format, it's not. But you would have to charge a premium for that for your wedding photographer. Like, hey, we got a package here. I'm going to shoot this with the. You know, 102 megapixel medium format. The images will just melt your crotch. They're incredible. And you can get wedding clients that have a few dollars that would pay for that. But nevertheless, full-frame cameras absolutely own the hell out of wedding photography. And uh, I already made the mention about D7200 uh, D or uh, crop sensors used for hardcore wildlife photography for countless examples like National Geographic shooters whatnot. Um... For a hardcore corporate product, a macro architecture and landscape, I mean hardcore. Whether you're either doing it for, you're taking it ultra seriously, and you, you know, you want the best of the best of the best for a hardcore, like I said, corporate product, macro architecture and landscape. Period. It's not. It's, you know, so what's wrong with that? You know, some of the best uh, landscape and portraits are done with full frame. That's correct. But the next level above that. It is medium format. I don't care if it's Fujifilm. I don't care whose favorite medium format you like. I'm not pimping Fujifilm here, contrary to what you think. Medium format owns everybody's ass on that front, period. My important word in that sentence that you're going to forget is I said hardcore. You know, balls to the wall, best of the best of the best, corporate product, macro, architecture, and landscape. And Fujifilm, for example, is working on a tilt shift uh, for landscapes. I know for a fact that they are, and they know people want it. Um, medium format portability for landscape photography isn't an issue anymore. I mean, look at Ansel Adams. I mean, he did landscape photography, hauled around an obnoxiously huge 8x10 on the end of a obnoxiously heavy wood and steel tripod. You know, that, that old, short old dude with a long beard can do it then the rest of you have nothing to bitch or complain about. This is, of course, about best versus, uh, you know, very good versus ideal. So what is, and this, of, and this video is not about Fujifilm, by the way. People say, why isn't Fujifilm going to make a full-frame sensor camera? Well, there's two reasons to that. Reason number one is that uh, there's no need for it. 
I told you the narrow spectrum mode of full frame is best at is, is next to non-existent. And number two, uh, sinking God knows how many millions of dollars into the front and going down into the battlefield and fighting it out with Canon and Sony and Nikon would just be incredibly stupid. You need to be in a, an endless bloody war with no end and no profit. Why not just jump over everybody and dominate everybody's butt on medium format? And I've been telling everybody this for over two years now. I said it well over two years ago, and I got video proof of it, wherever the hell that video is, saying, listen, Fujifilm's master plan is to own everybody's ass on ultimate image quality. I mean, own it. And that's exactly what they've done. But once again, this video is not about Fujifilm. It's not. But I mean, if we look at the spectrum where in which full frame is it, it's like, you know, you're going to head out the door, you're going to do this. Yeah, full frame. I don't care if that's a full frame Sony, full frame Canon with their crappy dynamic range or a full frame uh, Nikon. Tilt shift for uh, architecture and product photography. Yeah. Because um, the glass ecosystem, I mean, for basketball, football, photojournalism. Actually, for photojournalism, I'd rather have a crop sensor camera because the uh, information that's actually buffered is incredibly high. However, of course, Nikon D6 and the new Compact Flash Express cards are going to completely ruin that, so we're not going to have to worry about full-frame sensors with high megapixels buffering a, a super enormous amount of data. So, Because people don't realize, I used to do photojournalism work ages ago, people will ignorantly ask me, why do you need a flash you know, they can uh, pulse, and of course you need a power pack in that instance, pulse and take, you know, 12 shots per second with flash photographers. Like, you do need that for action and photojournalism because what happens, the most important shot that makes all the money, it will happen in a microsecond. And if you don't actually have a power pack with the speed light and a camera to machine gun out an enormous amount of shots, I mean, you missed it. You might have waited six hours for that, and you're like, boom. You gotta wait for the flash to recycle, boom. Or the camera to buffer. Not really an issue on the flagship Nikons like D5 and surely the, so the D6 have a bottomless buffer. So I'm 100% certain I'll have a bottomless buffer with compact Flash Express cards. But uh, for tilt, tilt shift and wedding photography and cheap, cheaper landscape photography, full frame doesn't really own anything. I mean, it, it does, but... Wedding photography is a huge arena. You know, if you wanted to get in, someone say someone, and this is always really an issue, and we have to be pragmatic here. Someone wants to, and I get this question all the time, someone wants to do landscape photography or architecture. Now, they don't have a tremendous amount of money. I mean, what, what would I do? I would recommend like a used D800E or D810 and a couple awesome lenses. I mean, you could do just jaw-dropping, full-frame, high megapixel images with a, like an $800 used D800E and a couple really good lenses and it wouldn't cost you that much. Listen, even though Fujifilm's the cheapest medium format is still damn expensive compared to everything else. Let's, let's be honest here. Um, I said crop sensor is not ideal for landscape or architecture. Perfectly fine for portraiture, yes? It was like, what's wrong with crop sensor? People always say that to me. It's like, there's nothing, but it's not ideal. It is not the best situation possible. Kind of like you could make your way to the kitchen to grab a soda on your feet, but you could also do it crawling on your knuckles. But you'd probably rather walk there, wouldn't you? There is what can be done, and there is what is ideal. I don't know why I keep getting that question. It's like, well, what's wrong with the crop sensor for portraiture or landscape? Or... Nothing. So you have this uh, Goldilocks thing. Not too hot, not too cold. Crop sensor is not ideal for, uh, for a wedding, portraiture, landscape, architecture, and medium format, even though medium format owns everybody's ass, period, for hardcore architecture portraiture product it's expensive even though it's this is stuff is the cheapest for example so we have this goldilocks middle zone and that's why full frame exists um full frame does own that area for that reason of practicality 
And like I said, the only two things it really does own is tilt shift and um, and wedding photography. That really is. And it's very cheap. You know, if you want to jump into hard some hardcore portraiture, but you don't want to spend a ton of money, nice, cheap, used, full-frame camera. Let's be honest. I don't care whether you think it's Sony or Nikon or Canon or whatever. I'm just talking about the sensor size. Also, too, of course, the glass ecosystem is obviously important. Fujifilm only has a couple large uh, lenses, uh, telephoto, 200mm f2, and the 100 to 400. I mean, it doesn't have a huge glass ecosystem like Canon or Nikon. The hell with Sony. Um, that's just the practicality of things. Anyway, I drone on too much. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you have a great week. Let's be logical and objective, right? Because I don't sell anything. The point is making you happy. The point is give you information so you can make a logical, intelligent, objective decision based upon all the facts. So you don't piss your money away unnecessarily on stuff that you don't necessarily, doesn't necessarily do it for you. And that's important. It's about saving money, saving time. Because educated decisions are always the right decisions. Or at least, at the very minimum, the best decision. Yes. Thank you.